Uh, we've had two great presentations uh, before this, and uh, the chairman also mentioned disruption. Tom also mentioned disruption, and uh, uh, Dr. Bandari mentioned this whole concept of the above-ground factors, which uh, are so important uh, for investors and for this business. Now, I will build uh, my talk upon just these two themes. Uh, Dr. Fisheraki in the morning spoke about something fundamental that has changed in oil and gas markets. When the whole world actually, you know, we've been talking about disruptive technologies coming in uh, solar, we've talked of graphene technologies developing which will make solar cells too cheap to meet up. We're waiting for huge shifts in storage technologies. The disruption happened somewhere where it's expected. That's a, that's a big lesson for uh, for policymakers. Disruption is basically about disruption. It hits you from the direction where it is least expected. And so much of our disruption, the primary lesson of uh, the Shalias evolution is that so much about this disruption is not really about path-breaking new technologies. It is not about someone suddenly discovering a totally new uh, technology one fine morning. It doesn't happen that way at all. A lot of disruption is about the simple act of putting one and one together to make it not two, but 11. And this is what happened with the shale gas revolution. The shale revolution just combined two things. It combined a technology which had been with the oil and gas industry since the 60s, which was hydraulic fracturing. And horizontal drilling or directional drilling had been around since the 70s or 80s, and you only kept on perfecting it with better steering technologies. Now, when these two were combined, you got the fracking revolution, which changed the whole oil and gas industry upside down. Now, the question is, why should it have happened in the US and not in China, which has many the shale gas resources which the US has. Or for that matter, why did it not happen in Poland? Or why did it not even happen in the United Kingdom? Now there what matters is precisely what Dr. Bhandari spoke about, above the ground factors. What lies below the ground, the resources which lie below the ground are only not even half the story. Actually, the resources under the ground are valueless. They have no meaning. They only have value once they're extracted, marketed, and utilized in the most efficient manner. Otherwise, they bring no benefit to the country in which they rest in. They can remain wherever they are. And unfortunately, that is the story of India. We are not singularly lacking in resources. We have sufficient resources. The problem, time and time again, comes to above the ground factors. Now, above the ground factors, there were many in the US which led to this revolution. I'll name two of the most important. First of all, resource ownership rights. Resources under the ground, mines, minerals, metals, were owned not by the state, but by landowners. So the result is that the transfer of extraction rights on these resources did not require a whole host of regulatory approvals and then judicial review post those regulatory approvals to bring them above the ground. The second above the ground factor was the market. Remember the shale revolution started in 2008. When Henry Hub prices touched $13 a barrel, $13 MMBTU in June of that year. Now that fundamentally removed the risks involved in adding one and one together and investors betted on these technologies that they would deliver the promise and give good returns. Investors were yes, chasing good returns. We should not run away from that fundamental fact. Now let me talk about reforms in India, the process of reform in India. See, it is common to mark 1991 as the turning point for the Indian economy, uh, when the country supposedly opened up to the winds of change, and decontrol is supposed to have become the new mantra. However, looking at the path the country has traversed, it seems that the problem with this reform story in India 
has been primarily one. That these reforms have been back to the wall reforms. These are reforms forced out under duress. In 1991 they began because there were certain conditionalities imposed by the lending institutions upon India. So we saw reforms introduced not with any conviction, but under duress, very, very patchy reforms in certain sections of the economy, in certain sections of certain sectors, without actually continuing down the road into the downstream end. More fundamentally, you see, these were all measures which were foisted upon what was essentially, and what is still essentially, a very much command and control economy. Com three words define it, command, control, and patronage. And as long as these three things continue to uh, factor, uh, are, the, are the primary determining factors in decision making, in policy making, there are going to be problems with the reform process. So this, essentially, this command and control system, this became the minefield, the actual minefield, in which the entire structure and scaffolding of the 1991 reforms was laid, and that, unfortunately, continues to this day, remaining its inherent weakness. Now, it is often heard that the PPP model, the private-public partnership model, has failed in India. The, this was the model which was supposed to deliver everything, infrastructure, airports, you know, telecommunications. It was supposed to deliver everything to India. The problem was the failure, the roots of the failure of the PP model lay in the very matrix of instrumentalities that pushed the reform process in India. And it's necessary to go into the details of those. Any system of command and control does not disappear overnight. It lingers. Because any system, once in place, will always seek to spawn and grow structures of governance that reinforce, strengthen, and sustain norms and rules that enable it to exercise ever greater power and control. And then what happens as a result is you have regulators, you have licensing agencies, you have implementing agencies then battling each other over the exercise of that power. And that is what has essentially happened in the process of reform. So given this, the award of licenses, their monitoring and control post-award, and that goes across the stream, whether it is in coal, whether it is in oil and gas, the award of licenses, their monitoring, their you know, implementation, their control, that remains a core competence of the implementing as well as regulating agencies. So under such circumstances, it should not surprise anyone that many public-private partnerships have metaphors into forms which are more described as just license grab. Now, it is in this way that systems or the lack of them came to be instituted for awarding coal blocks, airports, power plants, spectrum, whatever else, and until the Supreme Court decided to step in. The rest is history. Now, this piecemeal process of reforms the second thing which happened is that the easiest riddles were solved first. So in the first flush of reform, we saw policies for getting private sector participation in the upstream activities of production and generation, whether through award of blocks for oil or gas, or for coal, or licenses to set up power plants. You know, all these came first. Getting the private sector into the upstream generation or production cycle was the easy part. The problem was that the reform process, which should have continued downstream, and downstream right into the distribution cycle, right down to the consumer end, that never came about. So thus, instead of fostering competition and let properly regulated markets take control, we have witnessed constant controls over pricing and distribution, which in effect knock out the bottom of any reform measures which have been introduced in the upstream process. So you have public sector undertakings also bleeding because they are supposed to be financing, uh, you know, giving discounts to downstream companies, and you you have not introduced liberalisation measures in in the, in the crucial sectors like LPG, in kerosene. Those continue to be heavily subsidised. But hopefully now, with a new government looking far more energised, 
to pick up the pieces we heard the minister this morning and he spoke about you know how uh, direct benefit transfer schemes are being introduced how the government has moved in steps to decontrol diesel and other fuels perhaps a beginning is being made the most important thing to remember here is that and this is something which has been discovered by regime after regime across the world it was discovered by the russians when the soviet russia had collapsed it, it was discovered by deng xiaoping eventually that no matter what happens the strongest government in the world is ultimately weaker than the weakest market and the markets will take control governments can intervene but they can only intervene to drive markets underground so today falling oil and gas prices which we all been heard discussed at great length today they have they give a golden opportunity yes but they give a golden opportunity they give a golden opportunity perhaps which is a once in a generation opportunity to bring about core structural reforms the opportunity if it is used for fiscal rebalancing for short term fiscal rebalancing is completely wasted because this opportunity is not going to come again there is talk about investments falling because oil prices are low see investors are not shy of markets investors will take market risks they will decide where to invest which kind of fields to invest in at one point of time which resource to extract from where the only as the chairman also mentioned the only risk investor is not willing to take is this whole risk of policy unpredictability a country's energy insecurity basically arises only from policy uncertainty there is no other enemy there's no other enemy out there waiting to make you energy insecure the enemy lies right here and that enemy has to be better battled so today actually you have if you look in india itself globally consuming countries today have a headroom of 1.3 trillion dollars a year that is the kind of headroom there is an immense headroom to bring about changes in the larger structure changes in the governance models india itself has a headroom of about 45 billion dollars so the if you have the right mix of quantitative easing and market friendly reforms coming in it at this point of time you know which dovetail in with the breather which we've got by way of these kinds of energy prices then we are definitely on the winning side but let us remember we are not the only people in the market we are in a global competition the drop in global commodity prices comes at an opportune moment not just for us it comes for many other countries across the world so china is going to benefit from it other consuming countries south korea japan they are also going to be huge 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 beneficiaries and china in particular you know struggling against a looming slowdown is showing the keenness today to seize the initiative offered by this fall in oil and gas and commodity prices and move towards a path of greater and greater deregulation so the biggest gainers ultimately in this mailstorm will be those who are going to seize the moment this is indeed the time to launch the narrative for a new india the prime minister has said make in india is going to be the new slogan so make in india yes can be the narrative for a new india which generates sufficient opportunities sufficient jobs for the 1 million people who enter the workforce every month but this is not going to be easy this is going to require plenty of resilience plenty of leadership and plenty of courage and let us hope we finally have all these three in ample measure thank you